Hello and welcome to my latest video. In this video I'm going to be showing you how to paint this beast boss that Games Workshop kindly sent me. You can see it's already uh, stuck together. I have left one sub-assembly so the head isn't glued on. It's already primed black and I gave it a zenithal uh, highlight using pale grey blue from Vallejo. Now if you don't have an airbrush uh, so you can't do a zenithal highlights, uh, you can just use spray cans. So if you have like a, a light grey coloured uh, primer or you know, just spray can colour. If you just hold it above the model and give it a quick uh, squirt, it'll do the same kind of thing. It's not absolutely necessary, and if you wanted, you could kind of dry brush it a little bit if you use very thin paints. But all it's for the next process that allows me to put the, uh, some contrast paint over the top, so the uh, it actually works. You, you'll be able to see it. So you need the lighter colour for the colour to be visible, because obviously, if you paint contrast paints over black, they uh, they don't really show up. So. To start with, I'm painting all the uh, the flesh on the orc using contrast orc flesh, uh, and I gave it around about a 50-50 mix with some technical contrast medium. So that's to thin the the color down because it's quite a strong color. Uh, I don't want it to be purely green. I want some of the grey to show through because later on it'll be in the uh, the next video. But I'm going to be doing lots of highlights on the face with quite strong directional lighting and the uh, the highlights showing through will be a, a good guide for that. There's not that much visible uh, flesh on the orc, he's got a lot of armour and fur and stuff like that. But you know, it's, it's worth just thinning the, the paint anyway. It's not the end of the world, like if you don't have the technical paint you'll be able to get by but it just makes it a bit easier. Next up I'm using some skeleton horde. Now you don't have to thin this at all. As you can see as while I'm painting it on it's a much thinner colour, uh, really useful for painting on the, the fur, you'll be able to see the highlights very clearly and just gives them a nice bit of colour for a base to work on top of. All of this painting by the way that I'm doing using the contrast paints, you don't have to be that neat because the nice thing is when it runs into the crevices, uh, because of the zenithal highlight, most of the crevices will be dark anyway. So as I already mentioned that when the contrast paint goes over black it's barely visible. So pr pretty much you can just slop the paint on here and uh, you know not worry too much about it. You can see at the moment I'm using some Volopus pink just to cover all the... It's got like a, uh, a lizard type skin. I don't know what it is exactly but uh, you know I just gave it a quick coat straight from the pot again not thinned down. Now uh, Blood Angel red for the top knot. Uh, I've been extra kind of lazy for this bit as well so you see he's got some um, bangle things whatever they are tying the uh, the top knot together and I've just gone straight over the top of those with the red uh, and again on the little tassel at the end of the sword uh, one thing you can probably tell when looking at the model and this is one of the negative things for me about using contrast paints is it leaves quite a shiny finish uh, but You'll hopefully see by the end of this video, after I've worked on the shoulder armour and the claw, that painting on top of it will take away a lot of that shine, uh, and even then it's not something to worry too much about because I will be giving the model a coat of varnish at the end, so it'll kind of level everything out, and because it'll be a fairly matte varnish that I use, it'll take away all the shine anyway. So it will look a, a little bit rubbishy with the shine uh, after the first layer of just giving everything a quick coat of contrast paint, because it's going to look quite dark. I hadn't put a lot of uh, paint on the model to start with from the zenithal light so it's going to be extra dull but you know with the highlights from the painting on top and then when I eventually put the uh, the matte varnish on top it, it'll all level out so it's another one of these things where you have to kind of trust the process uh, that the end result is going to look okay even though it, as you're painting it it's a bit kind of rubbishy. Now I'm going to be covering everything that I want to be sort of bronzy goldy colour with a Griffhound orange. It's actually quite a nice colour for this because it's a, a little bit darker than you expect. Now if you painted this over say a, a white primed model it, obviously the, it's going to look a lot more orange because I've used uh, a light grey um, zenithal highlight over it. The, that actually means that you can see a lot of the black primer through there anyway so you know it's a very light dusting which means it's quite a dark grey that I'm working on top of it uh, which means that the uh, the contrast paint, when you paint over the top of it, it can never be that bright because it's just not that there's not enough white paint for it to show up. So it still looks kind of dark. So you you have this nice 
dark orangey color which is a fantastic base to work up from now finally I'm going to be using as you just saw there black Templar contrast paint this is again mixed with the technical medium the reason I'm using technical paint instead of or technical medium rather uh, rather than using water to thin it down is because that main the technical medium maintains the the properties of the paint uh, it's basically the the paint without the pigment in uh, so that allows it to still flow properly and work in its way into the recesses and everything if you use water it doesn't have the same properties and you end up with kind of a tea staining coffee staining effect when it dries uh, but that's only true like for this kind of where you're layering the paint on very heavily to let it all run into recesses. If you were doing glazing, it's perfectly fine to thin the, the contrast paint with water because then you're not relying on the uh, the properties of it to run into the recesses. You just need it to cover the the layer of paint evenly uh, and very, you know, in a very thin layer. And then that was to cover the rest of the model, basically. So anything that you hadn't already put paint on, then you just give it a coat of that mix of contrast uh, black Templar and the, uh, the contrast medium. So now we're actually getting onto the kind of the proper painting, if you like, and we're going to be looking at how to paint the bronzy color. Uh, and so I'm painting the this uh, skeleton head thing as a bronze material. I think Games Workshop when they painted it, they had it more as a bone color. But I, as I'm looking at it here, I can see it's got rivets all over it, and it's you know stuck in on with uh, quite clear separate shapes in there so as far as I can tell I think it's, a, it's supposed to be a metal surface that's hammered into the shape of a skull and I thought it was more interesting having it as a like a bronzy color rather than uh, having the whole thing just be like a lump of metal so you'd have you've got obviously the shoulder pad and the bottom of the jaw and things like that if you look at the marks I'm making and this is going to be something that's really consistent throughout the whole model the marks are going to be very scratchy, very rough. There's no meticulous blending or anything like that. It's just the, the blending that you're going to see is purely done by layering on top and all of the layers are going to have these kind of scratchy marks. And it sounds a bit weird that I'm using that as a blending technique, but it will all work together, especially because having the, the paint layers on top of each other, it does build up and give quite an opaque finish by the end. And having the you know the, the scratchy marks sort of spaced out further and further along as you get away from the highlight points, it does create a transition, kind of like the way stippling works as well. So the more tightly packed the marks are, the more opaque it is. Then the further apart they are, you get the lower the the base color showing through more, which then gives the impression from a distance at least that it it just looks like the area is going from a highlight to a dark and the transition as the, the marks get further and further apart showing more of the darker background through means it looks like it's it's actually getting darker also because and this is quite important as well if you see the marks I'm making I'm just using pretty much the tip of the brush sometimes the side a little bit not being too careful so you get some variation in the marks you get some slightly fatter marks and things like that although trying to be careful not to have too much paint on the brush uh, but the paint is still fairly thin. It's around about 50-50. You can go slightly more or less paint to water, depending on what your preference is. The more water you have, the easier it is to do all the marks very quickly, but they will be more translucent. So that means it'll show more of the base layer through, which means you have to do more layers. It just takes a little bit longer, but you'll get a, a neater finish. Uh, whereas if you have slightly thicker paint, you'll ha get the result much, much quicker. Sometimes it's more interesting to have the thicker paint as well because you get very definite marks. Whereas with the more opaque, the, the watered down paint, it, um, they're much the, the more subtle the marks that you leave. Uh, so it's less kind of painterly. But you still get the roughness there, but it, you know, like I say, it just takes a little bit longer. So you can, if you kind of balance it a little bit as well, uh, what I do is on my wet palette, the, the paint is thinner in the middle. When I add water to the paint, I mix it from the middle outwards and just naturally the paint dries around the very edges of the blobs of paint and so what that means is if I want much more watered down paint I can take it from the middle if I want drier paint I can take it from the very edge so I can have a mixture of uh, more opaque stronger marks or I can have thinner marks all on the same mix of paint for the positioning of the highlights uh, 
uh, you should hope like if you've done Zenithal Prime to start with, uh, that will guide you a little bit in the fact that the so the the, the top down Zenithal highlight shows the direction of the light because you know the paint follows a straight line when you spray it on, which works in the same way as the light. Uh, then of course you've given it a coat of contrast paint. The contrast paint will naturally flow into the recesses, but it kind of bounces out a bit. So because obviously there are peaks and troughs and all sorts of weird shapes on this uh, skull here, you can see that even if it's a lighter part, there are still you know darker areas and lighter areas. And you can use so you can use the contrast paint and the xenophil highlight mixed together uh, because it just gives you a little bit of a a bit of variation to it. So not everything in that's in line with the the light is the same brightness. And uh, it also allows you you know it just makes it so that there are parts of the model that will have highlight points and parts that will have shadow that you wouldn't necessarily think to do like that. It just takes a lot of the thinking out of the whole process you can just kind of follow the guide if you like now it doesn't mean to say that you can't add extra highlights if you want and it it can make the the whole look more interesting by adding just extra highlight little bling here or random reflections and things like that but you know a lot of the work is done for you just by having that quick xenophil spray and then a contrast paint layer over the top now if you wanted and you wanted to do the model really quickly uh, you know, you've got, you don't have to actually paint any of it uh, with the, you know, using the normal paints. Once you've given it a, the, a layer of contrast paint, if you just quickly spray it with a, a very matte varnish, it, you've got something that's, I think Games Workshop call it battle ready or something like that. It'll look okay. It, it'll work fairly well. It'll be a little bit more interesting than just painting contrast normally over a model because you've got that zenithal spray. And also, if you say you do have an airbrush and you wanted to just uh, make it a little bit more focused, you can over highlight some areas that you want to be focal points. And then when you give the, the contrast wash over the top of those, uh, the colors will be more vibrant and the highlight will still stand out more. Then once you give it the matte varnish so it knocks back all of the shine, it'll just look more like it's just been painted normally with uh, kind of like, you know, very basic highlight and shade on there. Uh, so if you just want to do, get something done really quick, I think it's more interesting using a, a zenithal highlight rather than just having a flat colour. You can see still that I'm making progress with the layering for the non-metallic uh, claw. Uh, just to go over the, the colours that I'm actually using. So the top right hand corner, that's Baylor Brown. Then below that is Ice Yellow. Those are the two main colours that you're going to need. Uh, the other ones are more, you know, just for pushing the effect a little bit more. So to the top middle, that's a 50-50 mix of Baylor Brown and Ice Yellow. Uh, if you don't want to mix the paint, you could use something like more gas bone. It's very, bone. It's very, very similar. Uh, below that is Uriel Yellow. Uh, in the top left is Mornfang Brown and obviously it's white there as well. The Mornfang Brown is something that's going to be entirely dependent on if you make a mess or not. Uh, so it's more to use as a rubber. It's much closer to the uh, the base color, the, you know, the dried base color. So you can use it as a rubber if you go a bit too crazy with any of the highlights, or you just want to, you know, knock things back a little bit. And the Uriel Yellow is uh, that's going to add a bit of warmth. What you're going to find as you add these highlight layers on is that it's going to start looking a bit desaturated, because especially, you know, with the ice yellow. Uh, it obviously has some yellow in it, but it's much closer to a, a white color. And the more of these highlights that you add, so the 50-50 mix of the Baylor Brown and Ice Yellow and the Ice Yellow, you know, both of those colors are taking away all of the, the warmth from the piece. And it looks, it'll look more like a bone armor. And so that's why you'll want to go back a little bit with the yellow, but the, the yellow has to be watered down quite a lot. So it, it'll be more like a heavy glaze. You'll see in a moment when I start to use it. At the moment, I'm still plotting out some of the highlight points. Now, if you find that you've lost a little bit of the guide from using the Zenithal Prime, uh, you can still hold the model under a lamp and see how the light is hitting it. It'll give you some idea for how to get the light volumes and the you know the shapes of the highlights. 
And that's what I mean by the light volumes, because you know, a highlight that you're probably used to seeing is something like a, an heavy metal style highlight, which is primarily edge highlighting. Uh, but that's not a natural highlight. That's just to pick out shapes on the model and give it definition. Whereas a, a normal highlight is how light hits the model. And depending on what the surface is, so if it's like metal or cloth or skin, you, you know, each type of surface has a different type of highlight. For example, a shiny metal will have very strong, bright, uh, you know, very clear highlights. And they'll uh, the highlights will naturally follow the, the shape of the surface and to a certain extent, depending on how reflective the surface is, the shape of the light source. Uh, but it's ten generally you don't worry too much about the shape of the light source unless you're doing something like sky earth non-metallic in which case you'll be doing uh, you know very specific reflection shapes but when it's something that's more matte but you know you get lots of different metal surfaces some obviously a chrome that's like a mirror finish but more like say a, a like a brushed steel that's uh, much more matte so the light is diffused on it so you don't really get uh, reflective shapes as such you just get a, a rough light source um, light volume on there and it's usually easier to go with that uh, or not necessarily easier but uh, you don't have to think quite as much about the uh, the shape of the reflection that you're painting uh, you just have to consider more the shape of the actual model but you know just think a little bit so say you were painting this and you wanted this to be a cloth surface rather than a metallic kind of bronzy color what you'll find is that if you paint the highlights too bright then it doesn't it won't look naturally like a cloth and it's something that i see no it's important to remember that not everything not everyone wants to paint something realistically so it's not that every certain ways are are wrong but if you want to paint a realistic look and you paint a cloth and you over highlight it so it has very strong highlights on it's Either you're going to make it look something more like a silk, which is obviously a very shiny material, or uh, you've gone a little bit wrong in the fact that it's over highlighted. And it's kind of it, it is a skill the uh, to be able to not over highlight something because the temptation is always to keep highlighting, and it's it can be quite tricky even for me. Uh, in that the temptation is you feel that you haven't finished the model unless you highlight something up to white. And it's a, it's a bad habit to get into because one, it defeats the point of the highlights a lot. The focal points tend to move around and you lose focus on the, the brightest parts of the model. If everything is white, then there aren't the strong focal points where you can use the final white highlight to really draw your eye to them. And it also takes away the finish of different surfaces. So if you've got a surface that is supposed to be dull and matte and not catching a lot of light, if you've highlighted it up to white, then it's going to look as bright as the shiniest, you know, mirror-like finish on the model as well. Whereas if you have lots of dark areas, or at least some dark areas on the model with, you know, that look more matte, then it makes the shiny areas look more shiny. You can see now uh, what I was talking about with the, the, ye the yellow colour. Uh, so again, it is very heavily watered down when I applied it, and I didn't put much paint on my brush. Uh, that it's really important that uh, because it's watered down so it's quite uh, wet it's probably like three three-ish parts water to one part paint again test it on your own model or test it on your thumb or whatever you know but just be careful when you apply it don't just slap it on there because the more wet the paint is so the more water added uh, what will happen is that it's the, very easy for it to run into crevices uh, whereas you want this you know purely for the, the highlights really or at least the mid-tones so that you can get that yellow color back in there. Uh, one of the other things that I've been doing on this is adding uh, quite a lot of edge highlights. Now I'm still focusing on the upper edges to get all the, the bright white highlights. And you can see here where I'm taking it up to the, the final white highlights at the moment. So that it's mainly the upper edges that are getting the bright white highlights, but you still want some lower edge uh, highlights on there as well. Just one, to define the shape, but two, to represent sort of the bounce highlights. Because one of the things when painting non-metallics is the easiest thing to paint are curves. The hardest thing to paint are flat surfaces. The problem with this model is that most of the surfaces are kind of almost flat. Uh, but the only saving grace is that it does have a lot of angles. 
and now uh, edges and angles they catch light a lot uh, so you can push the high contrast and the high contrast is really handy to get you know again that non-metallic effect so you can work with it a little bit but if there's just a few more kind of s shapes on this model and uh, smooth curving surfaces it will just make it a little bit easier to get some of the bounce highlight effects which are the best things for selling non-metallic highlights if you see some people when they paint say um, busts and things of uh, medieval knights um, it's much much easier to make those look non-metallic because they have these nice curved surfaces where you can paint the main light source but then you can paint soft bounce highlights on the other side and it really does trick your eye very easily into making it look metallic uh, so that's most of the work done on the uh, the bronzy color on the claw you can do the same you know hopefully from that you can do the same effect on all the other bronzy parts on, that you want to do on the model now it could be the case that you want to do say the shoulder pad in the same effect uh, it's, you know so hopefully you can still replicate that because all the techniques are the same you should be able to see there as well that I've done the same on the kind of hook part on the sword that he has over to the right I'm also going to do it on the the top three little bits there but I forgot to do that in the video um, but the next time you see an update for this those will be done as well uh, so now I'm going to work on the uh, kind of the grey armour if you like this will be sort of a, a steel kind of finish uh, you will see the scratchy effect uh, more clearly on this grey paints tend to be more opaque anyway it's much kind of easier to work with them in terms of getting the strong marks down there uh, also so normally when I do these uh, these effects non-metallic effects I just work straight from a black primer base and but I decided for this to try and make it easier for people uh, you know using the contrast paints it just gives you a base to work from you can see shadows and highlights and things a little bit to give you you know a, a kind of a guide and just getting those colors down there uh, makes life a lot easier as well like a lot of the hard work is done it's then just you know pushing up all the highlights you know creating contrast on the model uh, but I I well, as far as I can tell, people find steel type armor a little bit harder to paint in non-metallic than the the gold effect, at least, or, or it might just be the case that people prefer painting gold. I, I don't know, but regardless, uh, hopefully this will help you a little bit uh, on the process. It does have the same issues that I mentioned about the bronze skull area, because as you can see there's hardly any curves on this <laughs> this model at all I mean, it does add a lot to the brutal look of the the orc uh, so you know it's pretty atmospheric for the the sculpt it just makes it a bit harder for the painting but again there are uh, some saving graces on the way that it's sculpted in that it has very definite flat surfaces uh, so if you, you see on the the lower jaw section there it's not just you know one they could have just done it as one kind of flat sheet of metal with an edge on it but they've actually got like what look like little teeth hammered in there and you know little hooks and cuts all these little tiny um, bits of detail they just make it a bit easier to uh, what well, to get that, that high contrast look so you can have an edge you can paint or an, a surface that's more facing towards the light as a bright highlight pretty much the whole area then an area edge right next to it that's facing down that gets darker so you have very distinct uh, light direction being visible on there and of course remember that not all metal looks shiny <laughs> you know it can look pretty matte anyway uh, so you know don't worry too much about it being perfect uh, for the colors that I'm using I'm using dark sea gray by Vallejo uh, pale gray blue and uh, white I do add a little bit later on uh, some German grey. Now don't worry if you don't have any of these colours because they're all just various shades of grey. Uh, so as long as you have black and white you can mix your own. And in fact uh, it is easier to have more shades of grey than the four that I'm using, the four paints that I'm using there. Uh, because it can help with transitions. Uh, I picked the dark sea grey because it's a little bit lighter than most of the grey on the model that's left after giving it the Black Templar wash on top of the Xenophil highlight. Uh, but if you find when you apply the, uh, the grey that you have picked, 
you know, you, that's what you're looking for. You just want it to be a little bit lighter for the, the first kind of scratchy base thing when you're mapping out the highlights. And hopefully the highlights are kind of already there as a guide from you know the paint going into the recesses and from the zenithal prime. But if it's not, again, just hold the model under the lamp, see how the light hits it. Try and keep the model in the same direction when you want to check. It's okay when you're moving it around when you're painting it. Hopefully you can remember from looking at it. Uh, another thing you can do is take a photo just before you start. That gives you a very definite guide from you know so the light won't move. Because obviously as you move the model around when you're painting it, the light catches at different angles. But I actually find that is useful sometimes as well because uh, sometimes it looks you know different parts of the model can look a bit crappy. Uh, focal points can alter or parts can be used uh, you know look like focal points from uh, the direct light source and it doesn't pick out the parts that you want to that you think are more interesting so you can uh, pick a little bit of a light source from one a little bit of a light source from another area angle uh, and make it work that way so it, you it might be that it's not a perfectly accurate light depiction on the model but it looks better uh, you know don't don't ever be feel restricted by what uh, reality tells you guess reality can look you know rubbish sometimes Another nice little thing here is so you can see on that big tooth on the shoulder there, uh, because of the Black Templar contrast going into the recesses, you can then paint over with a dark sea grey. Remember, you can make, mix your own grey, but you want it, uh, a fairly dark grey. It's a little bit lighter than neutral grey. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> you can paint over the dark parts so it looks like actual scratches on the model as well. It does take a little bit of time to get all these scratches everywhere. <laughs> you can see there's a little time skip there. Obviously, I've not even finished that, so I've got to go back and paint uh, the gun and different things. I am going to do the uh, the big sword thing, chopper, that he has in a separate video as well because I want to do that in a slightly different style to the rest of the model. It's going to be a bit more rusty and high contrast at the same time. Uh, but... You know, there, there's a lot of texture marked uh, work to put onto the model. Having said that, it is a lot quicker than painting everything smoothly and cleanly and, you know, try and get rid of all the, the blemishes and things. Whereas this, you can see uh, the, the scratching is very definite with how I've painted it on, but I haven't really paid too much attention to if I get it in slightly the wrong place and things like that. It's kind of like the build-up of texture is more important than being incredibly precise. And because they they can all be represented as scratching on the model, if you go a little bit wrong, you put like a line going through a really dark area, like I said on that tooth section there, it just works as a scratch on the model. The main thing though is to <laughs> make sure that you don't get any paint on an area that you've already worked on. So you can see I've got those little triangles there. I try not to get any of the grey on those as you're going around. So some areas obviously be a little bit more cautious than others. In fact, actually this area that I'm working on on the model is one of the very few parts of the model that has a, a nice curved surface it's a bit of a shame it has those triangles on it but you can still get some bounce highlights on this area if you want so it, you've got the primary light source coming uh, you know from a top left coming downwards and it's hitting that section that curved part on the uh, i guess the part that's holding the, the big tusk on it uh, but if you go around to the right hand side that's where you could put a, a darker bounce highlight on there and if you really wanted you could paint some color reflection in some maybe a bit of green or whatever that's bouncing off your skin i wouldn't worry too much about colored reflections though on this kind of thing especially because it's more of an expressive kind of painting style uh, it might just look a bit like you've got green paint on the model uh, but you know it, it's it might be worth experimenting to see if it works or not It is also uh, a case as you move up the highlights. So now I'm on to the uh, pale grey blue. Uh, you Obviously you have to use less of it, so don't just completely cover the area. So any area that you've painted with dark sea grey, uh, you're obviously going to then be painting over the top of with pale grey blue, but just less of it 
you know, in the smaller area, you want to make sure there's still plenty of the dark sea grey visible. And indeed, when you get up to the white for the final highlights, really make sure that you don't use too much. The more white that you add as a highlight, the less effective it is. Uh, you want to have quite strong areas of dark as well. If you find that it's not dark enough in certain parts, uh, so I've got some German grey there, as I mentioned. Uh, it might just be a case of that uh, I just need a few areas darker, especially some of those flat areas on the front. Uh, so obviously the skull face on top of the shoulder uh, goes into a right angle as it goes down and faces forward on the model. So the forward facing part is quite dark and the top facing skull area, this is quite light. If the forward facing dark area is not dark enough, then you can use some of the German grey or indeed get some black. Now, I tend to prefer Vallejo model colour black. You can use Abaddon black as well. You could even glaze over the top of it just to darken it down. But you will need some high contrast areas. Uh, and so as I was saying, you know, you can add white, but don't go too crazy with the white because then you take away from the high contrast. If everything becomes too white, then actually it'll, the, the bright points that you want to be really bright and shiny, you can't make them any brighter because you've already used too much white. You can see that I keep hopping backwards and forwards uh, between the colours. I've tried not to uh, too much on this because I'm also doing a PDF for it and uh, it makes it much harder <laughs> with the, the steps when I'm taking photos it, by going backwards and forwards. Uh, but my preferred way of painting is so like that's why I have all the colors on the, the wet palette so you paint the, the colors there if you then if you suddenly see a part that needs to be a bit darker or a bit lighter you can quickly swap between the colors on the paint on the palette uh, and you can also not wash off the paint in between and then that will mix the colors so I mentioned before that you, the more mixes of a color that you have for the transitions the easier it is to get a, a nice transition but you can help that process by not mixing off the previous color that you have. So say you've, you've been painting some of the dark sea gray and you want to go up to pale gray blue. But when you paint, when you put some of the pale gray blue onto the, as a highlight, you find, oh, that's, that's way too bright. Uh, it's too obvious. Uh, it looks, you know, it's too high contrast. So then what you do is you probably wipe out a little bit of it going back with the uh, the dark sea grey and then you go back to the, the pale grey blue but you don't wash off the brush in between and what will happen is the paint will then mix on the model as you because basically both colour paints are on the brush now so it mixes on the model and then you have a transition colour that you've mixed but you haven't it, you know isn't actually from the wet palette again you can see that I'm focusing more on the upper edges for the highlights but still the lower edges have got some edge highlights on because it really just helps to define the shape of the, the model a bit on this. It is over exaggerated, uh, it is something that is more necessary on smaller scale pieces so uh, 28, 32 millimeter, that kind of thing, uh, high contrast and defined edges come more into play just because they're so much smaller so it's harder to see things whereas if you start painting you know large scale things busts uh, then more realistic style painting becomes uh, more useful uh, and indeed you can get all the subtleties and things and those subtleties are more visible whereas if you paint something subtle on this uh, it's going to be very hard to see it You can see here there's a nice little section at the bottom of this jaw where it so it's curved around a little bit so it almost works like an, an unfinished u shape uh, and right next to this spike is really nice so you can push the highlights on all these flat surfaces quite high you can see i'm not worried about getting it you know a very strong opaque finish but it's i'm still layering up the highlights it can it still looks dirty and scratchy but it's still also a very clearly lighter area than the bit just underneath it also for the scratchy marks you just have to look around and you can see if you put like a, a very quick highlight on the lower edge of some of these scratchy marks it'll look like an indentation or a dent and it make it look three-dimensional on the model this is a very quick weathering So I'm still making progress here. The 
the most intensive part of the painting on this is probably the uh, the skull face. There's it's just because it's such a large area uh, that you know to layer up the highlights is is quite a lot of, of uh, scratchy marks. So you're only gonna you see like there, there are time jumps in between uh, the uh, the cuts that I'm doing um, for the, for the painting because I think you just get bored seeing all the marks I'm making. Hopefully you're seeing enough to get a, a good general impression of uh, what I'm doing. It can also be a case as well uh, that you might think that I'm going over some of these edges and highlights uh, with the same colour over and over. Again that's due to the opacity of the paint because I've got the paint watered down uh, probably around 50-50. Like it, it varies, obviously there's drying times and things of the paint where it's been on the wet palette. So sometimes it's a little bit thicker, sometimes it's a little bit thinner because I've added water more recently. Uh, all those kind of things, but you, you, you just kind of adapt to it. Uh, but the opacity of the paint means that when you first apply the paint, when it's wet, it looks like a nice strong mark, and then as it dries, uh, you know the water evaporates, it becomes less bright, and some of the uh, the paint underneath or the base primer, if you're just going over black, it shows through a bit more. So it is quite often the case where I'm going over and over some of the highlights and marks that I've made just so that they become more visible and more opaque. It is a case as well as I am, go over the, the highlights. I'm just looking for areas to tweak. You have to be more precise the further up the, the brightness for the highlights you go. So by the time you get to the white for the you know the final highlights there, then you're being much more precise uh, and delicate with how you apply them. Whereas when you first started using the uh, the dark sea gray highlights, you know I was really just smacking them onto the model not really caring too much uh, I could turn some of the you know some of the mistakes into weathering you know happy little ac accidents as Bob Ross would say uh, you know it's a very relaxed kind of painting style but then the further up the highlights you go you have to be more careful just with the placement just to you know just to think about what it is that you're doing you don't want to turn your brain off by this stage you, you this is the uh, kind of the, the final tweaking and polishing sort of stage for these uh, final highlights. And even these bright sections, uh, I'm not adding too much white to them so that you can still see that the, the final white highlights are the brightest parts on the model and there's not too much of it just so it works with a high contrast. Also, uh, for some of the white highlights, I am doing them as blobs. So they'll, they'll be, in cases, they'll be a little bit larger, some of the highlights, than the pale grey blue highlights. Uh, that is just to represent that kind of shiny metal bling, you know, the glare that you get from uh, shiny surfaces. And you can also do kind of like little dots and dashes, uh, little broken up lines on an edge highlight. So it's not just a straight line when you do the highlight, you can do like a, th a couple of dots and dashes and things, almost like you're doing Morse code along the edge. That will then trick your eye into making it look like there are dents and scratches along that line. So it's, you know, it's not perfectly straight. You can see on that section there next to where the, uh, the rope bit, holds in through the eye of the skull there's that uh, very dark edge and then there's a white highlight in there it, it might not be super realistic but you can see how high contrast it is and it really helps to push that you know, high contrast non-metallic effect there and again I'm, I'm, I keep going over it these uh, highlights quite a lot. So even the final white dot highlights, they look bright to start with, then they dull down a bit as they dry. So it, you probably do want to go over them two or three times. Not all of them, some that you want to be brighter than others, but just to get that opacity for the final white kind of shine dot on there. <laughs> 
So now just very quickly, I'm going to do a bit of weathering. You can see I've already started on the lower jaw on the skull claw. Uh, yeah, the skull claw arm thingy. So I'm using Monfang Brown now. Uh, I do forget on the video, I, I forgot to record it, but I do do a secondary highlight stage with some Troll Slayer Orange. But it, it, it's exactly the same process as how I'm applying the uh, the Monfang Brown. It's quite watered down. It's around about one and a half parts water to one part paint. Make sure that you don't have too much paint on the brush again. The main areas that you're putting this in will be around rivets. Uh, any area that's really dark, you can afford to get put more on. Try not to put it on anywhere that's over the, the mid-range highlights. Definitely don't put it over the white because that'll make it look a little bit weird. This is to make it look like dirty and rusty. If you put this over the, the highlights, one, you're killing the highlights and you're killing the high contrast, but also it make the color show through really strongly from the, the Mornfang Brown. Whereas if you keep it to the mid-tones and the shadows, it ke keeps it as like a really sort of dark, rich brown instead. But as I said, you know, keep it to the dark areas, keep it to the recesses, do it, do the marks differently to how you did the scratching. So the scratching is lots and lots of lines. This is more of a stipply kind of effect uh, with patches of kind of smearing. Uh, you could also water it down a little bit more. You could do a little bit of glazing with it. Uh, in fact, if you just water it down and glaze on pretty much all the dark areas, it can look quite interesting as well. Uh, but as I said, just try and stay away from anything that you've highlighted up to pale grey, blue or white. Uh, and also, like as a, an interesting thing here, uh, as you go over some of the darker areas, you probably it'll hide some of the scratches a bit. You can then go back with the uh, the dark sea grey uh, and just pick out a few scratches in there. That will then represent scratches over the, the dirty area, which is kind of a natural thing that will happen anyway. But as I said, I forgot to do the, the Troll Slayer Orange part, but it's just exactly the same going over some of the, the Montfang Brown areas, just being a little bit more selective about it. Uh, you know, Don't go too crazy with the Troll Slayer Orange because it'll, it'll make it really bright. Whereas you want that dirty, dark and grimy kind of effect. It's probably going to be a case of less is more as well. You know, Don't just smear it all over the model. Uh, is probably more interesting in some of the the darker, more recessed areas, and keeping parts like the uh, the skull face on top uh, as a, like a more brighter thing that will then work as a focal point. So uh, there, that's the uh, stage that I've got to at the moment. Uh, there's going to be another video where I finish the rest of the model off, as I said, and look at how to paint the, the chopper that he has and make it look a, a bit more interesting so that the metal looks different from the other metal that's on the model, so it's not all you know, looking the same. Obviously, I'm going to be painting the skin and fur as well. Uh, but that's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please subscribe. I also have a Patreon and a personal website. Uh, where you'll be able to find as well. I'm doing a PDF for this, so if you find that you work better from PDFs or reading than you do from following videos, uh, you'll be able to follow it on there. Um, I'm also doing uh, Golden Demon stuff, so I'm working on Bellacore and some uh, vampires and things for Golden Demon entries. Uh, but as I said, that's the end of the video. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.